Hello the world, hello the internet, hello people with an unhealthy interest in different styles of government. Um, hopefully you're here for part two of an exciting series of presentations uh, from me on the structure of government. Uh, if you haven't, uh, well, hey, so hang around, there's nothing to go. Um, today what we're going to be focusing on is this, where are decisions made? Now that's both in an administrative and a management, sorry, in a physical and in a management sense, because that's going to determine whether cabinet is there to administer decisions or to make uh, the decisions themselves. And those are two different uh, jobs, and Cabinet normally performs both of them. Uh, but uh, depending upon the shape and style of government that, uh, that a Prime Minister is using, the emphasis or the, uh, or the bias on these two ideas is, is going to vary dramatically. And of course, within that great model of primus inter pares, uh, we, can consume, we can include both of those. So we've got three different levels, really, of uh, cabinet style, of, of ministerial style. Now, bear in mind, this is not a scientific uh, rating, okay? It's, it's very much <coughs> a degree of, uh, a degree, degrees of grey. And uh, <coughs> a prime minister may inhabit different styles within the same administration, and uh, they may uh, move from one to the other, and, um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's shades of grey, I think, as I'm, as I'm trying to say there. So um, we can see that, I think, if we look at numerous different administrations, perhaps in a little more detail. Uh, as I said, it's a spectrum. You've got collegiate at one side, prime ministerial at the other. And uh, if we start perhaps with Blair, it might superficially look the most simple, but in fact, it's a bit more complicated because these two very much moved as a unit. You can't really look at the Blair administration. You have to look at the Blair-Brown administration because whatever Blair was doing, and certainly he was driving the bus, he was in the back making sure that the tickets were stamped. So between the two of these guys, they ran the administration. And uh, Blair was very much the front man, whereas Brown sat in the back waiting for his chance to get on board. And in the meantime, making sure that all the money decisions went through him. And of course, virtually every decision involves money. Um, we move from that to Thatcher. She's another interesting example. She pretty much started there. And as her administration moved on, she moved further to the presidential side. Uh, GB himself, coming after a very divisive administration, inherited a cabinet and indeed a party that was divided, and hence he had no real choice but to manage a collegiate style or a consensus style cabinet. And very much the same is true of John Major, following uh, the very divisive, very presidential Thatcher, he was there to try to rebuild the bridges. Again, a peculiar circumstance, we had the coalition, and it's no mistake that Cameron's in front of that. Uh, but they, by very nature, had to manage from the middle, and what we had was a strange form of government called Quad Government. It's a bit of a one-off. Um, the examiner's probably not going to ask about it, but they might do. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's an ad hoc uh, reaction to a very specific set of circumstances. Now, where does that leave Dave? Uh, well, we don't know. I don't know why I did that. Uh, but I uh, don't know why Dave's there. Uh, so we don't know quite where Dave's going. We'll perhaps try to discuss that in the next administration, in the next presentation, sorry. But what I want to do now is just have a look at the two more important things you need to know about. Um, the PM office, obviously this relates directly to number 10. This relates to the PM. And uh, this is there to try to help him do his job. And this is to help cabinet do the job. Now, one of the interesting little things here is that Blair actually folded this one into that one, just in case anyone was in any doubt that he wanted to govern from the centre. And uh, I think if we look at these two things, we can see that there's a fair degree uh, of overlap, because really what they're trying both to do is to make sure that people don't make a mess. Now, you're not going to get a question on these uh, directly, but they will help you to explain uh, a rather peculiar idea, and again, a kind of vague idea, uh, which is fair, nevertheless fairly central to what we're talking about now, and that is the core executive. Now, the core executive says, okay, we've got three distinct uh, offices here. Uh, we've got here on the first, we've got cabinet, and then we have got the number 10 office, and then we've got the cabinet office. And core executive theory says, well, what we've got essentially is one little body there in the middle which pretty much runs everything. And they will take uh, individuals from this branch and that branch and the next branch, and that really is where decisions are made. So we've got the cabinet office, we've got cabinet and the number 10 office, <coughs> possibly other areas. And uh, the, the theory says that there is a core group of people within that who are there to make decisions. And we can see perhaps some uh, examples here. Now, again, this is not a scientific exercise. 
But looking at new Labour core executive, we certainly had Blair, very much the front man, uh, the great communicator. Um, and his, his job there was to win elections, basically. Then you had Gordon Brown, who liked to think of himself really as the brains. Uh, and, uh, you know, make no shadow of doubt, really quite a, uh, an extraordinary uh, political brain. Uh, Mandelson, the chief sneak or chief fixer. Um, and Alistair Campbell, of course, was the mouthpiece. His, he was the mouth. And um, if we look at Jonathan Powell, he's another one of the brains. Uh, certainly a very, very clever chap indeed. Um, if we move over to Cameron's core executive, you'll note here that this is a question mark. We still don't know. But this looks by any measure to be a reasonable uh, sort of selection. The various people you need to know about here, well, Oliver Letwin, definitely the brains. Uh, if we were to look at Osborne, he is the leader in waiting. Uh, hopefully less poisonous a relationship uh, between him and Dave than uh, the uh, relationship between the TBGBs uh, here. Uh, anyway, uh, hit number 10, this guy seems to be uh, an excellent fixer. And uh, this guy, again, is working largely with Letwin. Uh, but we'll, we'll find out how this works out. But again, we're looking at that idea of wheels within wheels, that within the executive, there is a core executive that straddles the number 10 office, the cabinet office, and indeed various positions within cabinet. And again, the question is, where are decisions being made? Are decisions being made within the core executive, on the Prime Minister's sofa, or indeed in the uh, on, on the cabinet dining table itself. Um, as I said, the quad government, the quad government. This was a peculiarity uh, of the uh, of the coalition executive, and uh, really there were just two main rules, and uh, that's one and two. The interesting thing here, the, the the most interesting thing, really, I think, to emerge from the coalition was the, the real authority that the Lib Dems seemed to have. And we saw that when they left the administration. Uh, when the, when the, uh, after the 2015 election, we saw the Conservatives lurch significantly to the right uh, in terms of the ideological attack on the state and the attempts to ramp up the uh, security measures that were going through Parliament. We can discuss that in class. I really want to get through a bit more stuff before we get on to that. Um, and I think it would be kind of unfair for them to ask you directly about the coalition executive, but um, whoever said that life was fair. <clears throat> now then, it's entirely possible I'm going to be able to go on to this in a little more detail, which I didn't really expect. Um, just digging in a little more detail to try to get you lots of good examples that you're going to be able to use in your work. Um, here we are. Um, and note that I've got 2015. 2010 to current, I suppose we should probably break that down into 2015. Um, anyway, we'll worry about that when time comes. Let's have a look at Thatcher. There she is. Um, I do go on about Thatcher because it's so interesting. Um, and again, three stages of style. It's not science, okay? This is all about analysis and evaluation. Uh, but let's push on a little bit. Now, she was one of the first prime ministers to rely heavily on SPADs. And uh, Nigel Lawson was a Chancellor of the Exchequer who uh, basically wound up having a massive scrap with Sir Alan Walters, who was her economic advisor, uh, after which he threw a hissy fit and resigned. Quite an interesting little point there. Um, and uh, without a doubt, Thatcher was somebody who liked to get things done, and as a result of which, she tended to eschew uh, cabinet meetings. And it's worth pointing out, yep, she didn't uh, actually lose any elections. She really just ran out of allies, and um, she undermined her own authority. Uh, with a, a series of increasingly dictatorial positions. But perhaps we should have a look at those. Um, and uh, here, perhaps, we've got a very unscientific plotting of the Thatcher administration. Again, we really make, need to make sure that we have examples from the Cameron era as well, but this was just so interesting. And you need to know it that we have to start off. Anyway, so we start off with Thatcher, the consensus manager. This is because she was a woman in a conservative administration. That might not sound like such a big deal now, but it was certainly a huge deal back then. And Mrs. Thatcher, the Iron Lady of legend, uh, didn't start off as the Iron Lady. She was, um, she had been the Home, Se Home Secretary, Education Secretary, can't remember. But she was by no means an obvious leader. And uh, when she came in, she encountered a vast amount of hostility. Uh, or a lack of cooperation, perhaps, from the wets. And this was called the wet government, uh, wet cabinet, and foremost amongst them was Pym. This brings us back to the idea that the Prime Minister has to perform a balancing act between the cabinet they want and the party, and the, and the cabinet their party wants. And as a result, Thatcher was, was, forced to co was forced to compromise, and she had a lot of people in the cabinet that she would rather not have had. 
Fast forward to 1980, and she wins a massive rebate from the EU. The EU gives us back a huge amount of cash, and the Conservatives being the Conservatives, <clears throat> they rather like this. And so her authority grows, and we shift from being subordinate to Cabinet to this much more central figure in the administration. That then rocketed skywards in about 1982 when she won the Falklands War. Uh, she wasn't actually there personally, uh, but uh, ask anyone and they'll tell you that Thatcher won the Falklands War. Now, a bit of a dip here, and again, this is contentious, but you know, she's still on the presidential side of the scale, and this is her economic reform. We like to think now that Thatcherism is essentially a given, that everyone was behind it. Well, they weren't, and she needed to try to bring her cabinet along with her. And uh, that was by no means easy, and concessions had to be made. But as time went on, and we had the miners' strike, and then we had the, uh, <clears throat> the Westland affair, we see Thatcher moving ever more to a presidential style of government, less accommodating of dissent, more autocratic. And again, there's another tick up there when she went out to the EU and started a very, very hardline negotiation that was going down particularly badly with some of her more Euro, uh, Europhile members of cabinet, particularly as we shall see um, Doug, um, Jeffrey Howe. Um, we've then got the poll tax and she's becoming increasingly isolated and things aren't looking particularly good and then well we go sliding off the scale when Sir Geoffrey Howe, her uh, Foreign Secretary, resigns and delivers a stinging speech uh, in Cabinet, in Parliament. After that her administration was essentially bereft of authority. Cabinet could no longer support her as once they had and uh, as a result of that she was left with very little choice uh, but to resign. Here are some more examples of uh, where policy is made. Um, now, these are all from the coalition, but trust me, this one is definitely still going on. Uh, IDS and Osborne are definitely not on each other's Christmas card list. The Govan education battle was very entertaining, but of course, now that he's at justice, that's no longer the case. Although May is still going on and on and on about immigration and indeed drugs. So it does look like these ministers, May is running the Home Office, IDS is running the, uh, is running the uh, welfare reform, and May is certainly uh, dictatorial on the issue of drugs. When we come over here, we can see some very, very important decisions here that were made by the Blair administration that were very much driven by Blair, uh, with, of course, Brown uh, behind him. But as we move away from the, uh, the, the glory days of New Labour, particularly after this, we see the way in which Brown was, uh, to a certain extent, sidelined. And certainly the ideological drive, such as it was for New Labour, was coming from Blair. And uh, Brown's position shifted at this point to become one of, well, outright obstruction by the end. And uh, yeah, with Thatcher in Europe, they've got that particular element there. So here are some examples from uh, before the, uh, the new Labour administration. And I think that's all fairly straightforward. Uh, we can deal with that in, uh, in class if anyone's uh, coming up. Uh, when we move into the Blair Brown administration, I think at this point, I'm going to have to stop. We'll pick this one up with the next uh, presentation. And I look forward to seeing you there. Bye now.